what I would want future students to know about May 4th would be that they were just like you. They lived in a different era, there were different political concerns, but those parallels and those struggles, they still exist today. And you do have a legacy here to be a part of that and to continue the change that they were fighting for. As a college student on May 4th, I remember hearing as many college students did, uh, news of something in my backyard that was both disturbing and personally frightening. This was before cell phones and the internet. This was a pay phone at the end of the hall in my dormitory lined up with my, you know, floor mates because we all knew somebody at Kent State. Many of us had been to Washington in the anti-war demonstrations of 68, 69, early 70. Many of us have become politically motivated, expressing our, our distaste and distrust of government generally, uh, and had cousins, brothers and sisters, who lived in dormitories nearby. And so there was, first of all, that uncertainty about what had happened in your backyard. There was the second very raw emotion uh, about how could our government do this to our people? open fire on the students, killing four of them, two young men and two young women. Three were shot in the chest and one in the head. A dozen or more others were wounded, some by gunfire and some by bayonets. The university is closed and all faculty and students have been sent home. The students were protesting the American invasion of Cambodia. It is not our power, but our will and character that is being tested tonight. One thing in mind, that is to destroy higher education in Ohio. The guard on campus, Governor Rhodes' rhetoric, and that betrayal Sunday evening, there was an extra edge of anger and frustration. One of the National Guard jeeps drove up to the front. They started reading uh, an order for everybody to disperse. There wasn't anything out of control. We had a right to be there, and they could not stop us from speaking. We were not an unlawful assembly. Get the hell off our campus. Then, of course, it's tear gas time again. Tear gas began to arc over, crowd into the crowd. By then, we'd gotten fairly good at being able to pick up uh, the cool end of, of the canister, because the other end's hot and toss it back, returning the favor. Now the National Guard started marching toward us. They had on helmets, gas masks, and they were carrying M1 rifles with the bayonets attached. And I was among hundreds of students. We ran up over Blanket Hill. The guardsmen came marching across the commons. They followed us up the hill, past the pagoda. We all ran down the other side of the hill into the Prentice Hall parking lot. 
We started picking up whatever we could and trying to throw it at the guard. Of course, we were at the bottom of a hill. It was not a really good strategic position. We didn't have steel helmets and gas masks to protect us. The tear gas exchange stopped and students started chanting, they're out of gas. And then I see this, this one student with a black flag, once the guard had stopped, sort of slowly work his way. And I'm saying, wow, there's my picture. And I stood there, I waved my black flag, I knew my life was in danger. But at that time, I thought, if I have to risk my life to make the most powerful statement I can make, I'm going to do it. I walked up behind my brother and I said, Alan, they are aiming right at you. This is getting really shaky. And just as I said that, Troop G just started to move away in a V formation and start their ascent up the hill. And I asked him to come back to the parking lot. And Alan said, wait, I, I want to see where they're going. And as I looked and my sister watched, they started marching up the hill. When they got to the top of the hill. It hit us. They didn't go anywhere. About a dozen men stopped, turned, raised their weapons. I saw a guy pointing a rifle towards me. The guardsman with the baton in his hand was saying, get set, get ready, fire. This metal sculpture just erupts in this cloud of rust. Tree, nice big chink of bark comes off. The student got hit to my right. I was just knocked to the ground. A bullet hit my wrist. I thought, this is like a bad dream. We could hear bullets zipping past our, our heads and thumping into the ground. Jimmy Riggs pulled me behind a car, riddled with bullets. Tom Grace, he's screaming. I looked over. The boot was blown off of his foot. And he's yelling to me, stay down, stay down. And when you're caught in the open, being fired on, with no opportunity, to defend yourself. It's the loneliest and sickest experience you can imagine. I was at a house of a friend in Butano Canyon in California. And uh, we heard about it on the radio, we didn't believe it. And Neil and I were out driving around in one of his woodies and we went over to this friend's house and a friend came back from the store with a magazine with a girl kneeling over the dead kid. And I watched it hit Neil. He opened the magazine and looked at this thing and he, hit him in the heart. And, uh, and I watched him right Ohio, right there.
I hear the drumming for dead in Ohio. I remember the very first time that I watched the video in the May 4th Visitor Center at the very first floor of Taylor Hall. The, it, was one of my, it was a requirement from one of my classes. And I was sitting there with 20 some other students and I heard Glenn Frank, his voice saying, I don't want to be a part of this. And he was urging these students to disperse or else there would be a massacre. He was begging, he was pleading, he was sobbing basically. And I, even now I get a little bit emotional thinking about it because there's something really strong in that phrase of I don't want to be a part of this because who would want to be a part of that kind of situation where if students don't disperse they're going to get gunned down by the very people who are supposed to protect them and that's something that relates to me because no one wants to be a part of society that's faulty but that's not a choice that we have no matter if you're in America in the Philippines wherever you are around the globe there is a problem with the government. There is a problem with society. There are injustices everywhere. You don't get a choice at the end of the day. You have to be a part of it, and that in itself is a privilege, is to be a part of it. We must ensure that we prepare our next generations to understand and remember the significance of that day and how activism of the Kent State students shaped the course of history around the Vietnam War. It occurred to me that the rituals of the May 4th week are trying to do just that, attempting to have, tell what happened on May 4th. There are various rituals that have occurred during this Remembrance Week, such as the faculty forum, the poets programs, the Daily Kent Stater Special, the art show, the candlelight walk, which was beautiful last night, the vigil, and of course this dedication. Let me say at once that I do not use the word ritual in a negative way, for ritual is an important part of any society. It informs us that above all we are social beings, for ritual is in, performed in concert with others. It tells us that we are not alone in times of joy or tragedy. It separates the important from the mundane. The annual vigil serves the ideas of inquire, learn, and reflect very well. We inquire and learn each year about the distances that the slain and wounded were from the National Guard. The vigil guides us to reflect upon our fallen students, Allison, Bill, Jeff, and Sandy, the wounded students, the students who left the campus never to return. Shakespeare wrote, there is history in all men's lives. Twenty years ago, history stopped for four young people. Their history is our challenge.
they died for a reason, a sacrifice, and that has to be remembered. Because if you say that no one's responsible and it was just a misunderstanding, it's an insult to their memory. We also need to remember the students, not as victims, but as individuals. In their short lives, they had each made an impression that will be remembered by many. Allison Krauss spoke the words which were heard and will be remembered around the world. What's the matter with peace? Flowers are better than bullets. Jeffrey Miller's letters to his beloved Nana after the death of his grandfather relate a story of love and caring beyond what is expected of a young man in his teens. While still in high school, he wrote a poem in which he said, the war without a purpose marches on relentlessly, not stopping to mourn for its dead, content to wait for its end. But all the frightened parents who still have their sons fear that the end is not in sight. A friend who wrote about Sandy Scheuer after her death remembered her as truly alive and overwhelmed by the greatness of her existence. She was unique as an individual with an aura of innocence. She was developing into a woman of quiet joy and peaceful acceptance. She was a perfect listener. She loved to laugh and found pleasure in everything. In May 1969, Bill wrote a poem as a Mother's Day gift to me. I want to share part of it with you. Days gone by shall never return, despite the most reverent of prayers. It is not all in vain. I will certainly learn from previous conflicts and errors. Learning from the past is of prime consideration. Your many influences will linger and last to be passed on through me to the next generation. We gave them love, we gave them roots, and we gave them wings. Their wings carried them away much sooner than we had hoped. <clears throat> Considering the circumstances, I do not believe that they can rest in peace, but I do pray that they can revel in the glory that is heaven. Shalom. The events of May 4th influenced me by encouraging me to speak up and not, not be scared to speak up. Um, I feel like sometimes as an activist, it can be hard to use your voice in certain situations, but I know those students spoke up for what they believed, um, and that really encouraged me to speak up throughout my time at Kent State. Today we are here to unveil markers for the students wounded on May 4th, 1970. These markers represent the latest addition to the National Historic Landmark Site and provide greater insight to the events that happened on May 4th, 1970. Only two of us were facing the direction of the guardsmen when the bullets hit us. So we're talking about 11 people struck in the back or the side who weren't even looking the way the guardsmen were shooting from. Um, I have personally forgiven these two men for shooting me, not so much for their good, but for my own. But I don't forgive them for killing four students who died that day. That's not my place. At the time, I was uh, going to class and uh, so I was basically at the wrong place at the wrong time. I was an innocent bystander. Uh, after the shootings, uh, there were so many stories that came out in the paper, so many exaggerations. I think it's important that you listen uh, to those people that were there, that were eyewitnesses, uh, because uh, I think they give you a more objective viewpoint than very often what you read. I myself was um, about 150, 160 feet away. I heard one or two cracks. I'm not sure if they were from a 45 or, um, or M1 fire. I started to run. I didn't get more than a step or two, and the bullet 
entered my left heel and knocked me on the, on the ground. That may have actually saved my life. I was taken to the ambulance, or taken to the hospital in an ambulance with uh, Sandy Scheuer. Um, she died right next to me in the ambulance. That's something I'll never forget. On uh, May 4th, I was an observer. I wasn't part of the uh, group of kids down front. So I saw the National Guard moving the kids up and down the hillside. Once I was shot, I had no idea what was going on, and I was whisked off to the hospital. I think real healing can only come with the truth, and that's why months ago, the mothers of the victims here, the mothers of our martyrs, made an appeal to the National Guardsmen, come forward and finally tell who gave the order to shoot at Kent State. And I think once we have that information, that's when the healing process will really take place. As a wounded student, I feel no bitterness. Only forgiveness is in my heart. To quote a newsman, morally safer, he said the other day, bitterness is the prerogative of a loser. Those of us who were shot were not losers. And, and I was quite a ways away, and there were at least 500 people between me and the guard. And I was walking away because it didn't look like it was going to get good. And I didn't especially want anything to happen to me, so I mean, the guard and myself. And, and somehow I managed to get shot. It's not going to be anything that comes from a freedom of information request or from a, a, a document that gets discovered that's going to shed any additional light on the events of May 4th. It's going to be oral testimony from an individual guard or from a group of guard or former guard who decide to come forth and tell their story. But we're either going to get the truth about this or not get the truth based upon what a handful of guard do or do not decide to say from this date on. these markers uh, connect us to Kent State's most important day in its worst 13 seconds. These markers really kind of uh, bring a sense of uh, uh, reality as to where these people were when they were shot. I do think it's very important to have the markers uh, for the uh, benefit of people who come after the fact who can see the distances involved and uh, to put to rest the lie that the guardsmen on the hill that day used, which was that they were afraid for their lives, and so they had to shoot people to save their lives. We can see, too, how the gymnasium addicts that people like Alan Kent Ford tried to stop the construction of in 1977 enveloped the location where Jim Russell was struck by separate shotgun blasts. And we can find the spot on the on what remains to the practice football field, the former athlete, Dean Kaler, was left paral paralyzed by an M1 round to his back. So I think telling the story and understanding the, the scope of the distances from the so-called threats that the guardsmen perceived from people who were so far away and unarmed and unprepared for even a fight, let alone a battle, uh, I think that for that reason, the markers are, are very significant and important for understanding the, the story of the Kent State shootings that day. I think the other thing that these markers do is add a little bit of uh, human element to it uh, by uh, putting a name to these people and where they were when they were shot. Marking the locations will help uh, not only to preserve the history of that vitally important day, but, uh, but, but, but also to evoke a sense of place so people can visit there and try to imagine the horror of those moments. Many people knew Alan Canfora better than I did, but my encounters with Alan were always profound, and they left me with a better understanding of the death 
and breath of this individual whose life was marked by the dogged pursuit of truth, even though, at many points, this pursuit sparked misguided attacks that no doubt caused him great pain. One encounter with Alan stands out in my mind. The encounter I have in mind was a brief tour of the May 4th site with Alan so that he could point out which trees were there on the day of the shooting and which trees were not and had been planted in subsequent years. The tour ended with Alan hugging one particular tree and his noting that this tree had saved his life that day. A wounded student plaque with Alan's name now rests at the base of this tree, and each time I see the tree, I am reminded of Alan and of his pursuit of truth and justice. Today, we honor and remember Alan for his commitment to keeping the lessons of May 4, 1970 alive and relevant. Today, we remember a friend, a graduate of Kent State, a father, a civic leader, who was never afraid to challenge misinformation, no matter what pressure was brought to bear upon him and his family. We will always remember the lessons of May 4th, 1970, and we will always remember Alan Canfora. I have one final pleasure here today, and that is to introduce the next speaker. We have been friends for 22 years, have been through a great deal together. Can you please give them a whole nice round of applause and warm greeting, Alan Canfora. I remember the moment that I met Alan Canfora very well. Um, and of course, was always lodged on his, in his memory as well. I had just moved into the dorm that day and brought up several crates of records I, I, and brought a portable record player with me. And I was playing John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, the, the first album um, that featured Eric Clapton on lead guitar. And Alan could hear the music uh, even several uh, rooms down. We were, um, our dorm rooms were separated by one or two, one or two um, other rooms. But I must have been playing the music fairly loud. And if it bothered some people, it attracted Alan. And we became, we became fast friends discovering not only this, this passion that the two of us had for rock and roll music, but, but also for, for politics and uh, just the whole mood of the times. We were, very, we were very much in sync. But in my first political science class, after only about a month, the discussions every day turned to the war. And pretty soon one day a student stood up and said, well, everybody in our class, of course, is opposed to the war in Vietnam. And then I had to, from that moment on, start to think about whether or not the war was a legitimate war or whether it was immoral and unjustifiable as most of my classmates uh, had felt. So I started to investigate the war issue and consider all of the complicated aspects. And sure enough, I came to see the war was wrong. The first time we met, I, I don't exactly remember when it was. Uh, my, my memory goes back to 1975 when we got together prior to our civil trial we met our legal team which was like a whole batch of lawyers at a hotel in cleveland and the lead attorney joe kellner called me up to the front and he said uh, i introduced himself and told me his role and he suggested that i get a haircut and, you know, I said, I, I just cut off my ponytail. <laughs> and he said, well, you're gonna need to cut it a little shorter than that. And so I did. Um, but Alan, you know, he gave the same advice to all of us. And Alan didn't want to cut his hair. So Alan bought a short hair wig and he put that on over his ponytail and wore it in the courtroom day after day. And from behind him, we could see, occasionally see wisps of hair slinging down his back. Uh, and so that was, that was pretty, that was a pretty comical uh, side of a very serious man. One student ventured closer, that's me, waving a, my black flag, that's all I was doing. I didn't think I was any kind of a threat to these guardsmen. At this point, they were about 150 feet away. The guardsmen are kneeling, they're aiming, Three of the guardsmen are aiming at me in particular. At that moment, I thought my life was in danger. 
I knew I was risking my life, but I thought that if I wanted to make my most powerful stand, that I would stand my ground, and that's what I did. We kind of see Alan uh, for the first time wa waving a black flag with uh, long hair, and uh, we maybe form opinions about uh, him being a, a radical and working outside the system. And uh, when we see Alan's life, um, after May 4th, um, he got uh, involved in politics. Uh, he ran for office uh, and he held uh, some various political positions. So uh, Alan, uh, I think, worked very much within the political system um, to make change. I don't think anybody did more to disseminate knowledge about the fatal shootings than Alan Camphora. And he played a founding role in the creation of the May 4th Task Force, along with the late Robbie Stamps and Dean Kaler. I'd like to thank the members of the May 4th Task Force, first of all, uh, for uh, organizing not only this program, but I think what's going to end up being the most significant May 4th commemoration in 30 years on Thursday of this week. Uh, I hope people will continue to come to the Task Force programs. They meet every week from September until May. It's like they're having a baby every year. They would do this for nine months. And I think they really deserve the credit. I think that we have a lot to learn from Alan, uh, just like we have a lot to learn from the activists that participated um, in direct action after the Kent State shootings. He knew that if he and his peers didn't stand up, um, the government would sweep that event under the rug. And so he did his best to make sure that there was an organization um, and an initiative to continue remembering the four students that died. Well, you know, I was one of the students that was shot and wounded. I had a bullet that passed through my right wrist. Uh, I did shed my blood here, and down through the years, I've worked with other wounded students and the mothers and fathers of the victims. We were all bonded together as one big family in a long-standing court case during the 1970s. We became determined to work for truth and for justice. And we've worked down through the years trying to raise awareness and trying to keep this issue alive as a tribute to the four students who were killed here. And I, I can't tell you how sad I was when I found out that he had passed away. Um, for him and his family and, and all of us who lost such, such a leader, such a caring, impassioned person who, you know, who framed the, framed the whole uh, Kent State shooting in, in ways that uh, I thought of but never could express. It was, as, as, the, as the photograph of him on May 4th, that John Philo felt up until the time that he took the one that um, won the Pulitzer Prize, the photo that he took of Alan waving the black flag shows the kind of um, bravery that, that he had. No, no one else would approach the National Guard as, as close as Alan would. So he, he clearly had a fearless streak, and he also had a knack for calculated risk. If he, if he ever backed down, he backed down to very few. Uh, I don't ever recall him backing down to anyone. And I think that we owe this to them so that we can say that forever, long after we're gone, there will stand a permanent and proper tribute and stand as a reminder of the wrongfulness of excessive force here at Kent State. And in conclusion, in addition to this memorial, I just want to say again, the best kind of a possible lasting memorial tribute is the continuation of the student movement that they died for in 1970. The challenge, it seems to me, for a place like Kent State, which is now stuck in kind of the national narrative 
um, is to do something with that, and that's what this visitor center does. And it doesn't look away from its history. It doesn't say, well, that was an aberrational moment that we have gotten past and we've now moved on. May 4th, 1970 is a hugely important day in American history. Americans stopped a war. And it had to do with soldiers coming home saying this is wrong. It had to do with people on college campuses. And we witnessed the fact that for the first time we began to doubt whether our government was telling us the right things. And I think we can, the suspicion of government that has been part of the American character from the very, very beginning uh, has metastasized since Vietnam, since what happened here. I think one of the things they can learn is that um, I heard this quote I heard this at a seminar the other day, and I, I can't attribute it because I don't remember who said it, but I thought it was very appropriate. The quote was, an inert citizenry is dangerous for democracy. And speaking for me, I would like young people to know that it's very important for everybody in America to some degree or another to be a public citizen and to take an active interest in public affairs and voice their opinions. What the kids of today have to do is they have to do the work. They have to pay attention to the news that they receive and they have to analyze it. They have to. Uh, dissect it, find out what is really true and what is just being told to them because it's quick and easy. Uh, the soundbite media is something that doesn't help them at all. So th the real thing they have to do is pay attention. To take on um, projects in which um, a person can bite off a, a, a small piece and, and make a difference. and. And clearly, they're not going to be doing it, and they haven't done it so far, um, this generation, in the same way as it was done before. But that doesn't mean that young people today um, can't make a difference and are not making a difference. Um, I happen to be one of the um, um, older um, folks, now I'm 63, that doesn't like the scold today's generation, because I think they're going to do fine. I hope young people will take away that there was a struggle, there was a divide in this country and that we had to, our country uh, continually has to grow and develop. I try to behave in a peaceful fashion at all times and change things beginning in a personal way, in your personal relationships and uh, politics included. It's frustrating and difficult to think about changing national policy, but you can change personal policy. You can change local and regional policy and uh, state policy and, and grow from there. Uh, and I would say to, to be hopeful, uh, follow your heart and not give up trying. Student activism is just as necessary today as it was then. And we need educators who can inspire and who can empower students to find and to use their voices constructively to create change. Students should be activists because there are a lot of decisions that are made that young people aren't always a part of. Um, so we have to speak up and make our needs known in society. So I think it's really important that we have that voice um, and that's heard because the things that we experience is different than other people. Um, and if we're not using our voices, then no one will know what we need as young people and we won't be able to get those things. When they went to sit on that hill, blood had already been shed. You have to be that brave. If you're not, what's your life worth? If you don't stick up for what you believe in, what's your life worth? These people were brave. They were very brave, and they got shot to death for it. But they're still inspiring us.